Hey everybody, are your parents to blame for your dental problems or your dental decay? Many people believe that their dental problems are inherited from their parents. I get it all the time. Hi, my name is Dr. Peggy Bowne and today I'm going to be talking to you about the truth about cavities. Specifically cavities, there's other types of dental problems, but today we're going to be talking about cavities. And I want to share with you, you know, some of the factors that are associated with that. So if you want to hear more, let's get started. So the first thing is, um, again, there's what is a cavity? A cavity is basically a hole that gets formed in the tooth, and that's because and normally a tooth is surrounded by what we call enamel, and it's a very hard structure. It's very the hard structure in the human body, but it, it can be weakened or what we call demineralized. And so when a hole occurs, it usually takes three main things for it to happen. So the first is an exposure to acid. Now, acid is often caused by um, the presence of bacteria sitting on our teeth that create um, a byproduct once it can they consume sugar called you know an acid so the bacteria themselves don't really just cause the decay on their own we think of the germs or the bacteria in our mouth but they need to be fed the next thing which you need in the three things which is uh, the sugar so there needs to be a, some sort of um, fuel for this bacteria or again you could also expose your teeth to just pure acid which would be in the form of very acidic drinks and things like that so if we feed the if we have the bacteria and then we expose the teeth to um to the acid uh, and also the the the, the bacteria are consuming it, they're creating an acid. And then we have the third thing, which is of course the enamel substrate. So you need all three things together or your lack of oral hygiene to remove them um, combined to allow that to occur. The good news is that decay, dental decay actually takes a very long time to really form. So once I see your diagnosed um, dental decay, it's actually probably been there a little while. And so we have lots of time and that's why we'd like you to come in regularly so we can monitor uh, and now new ways that we didn't even have in, in, since the last year. We have a new, another new technology besides x-rays that we can monitor, monitor dental decay. Um, so if, you, you know, if you're coming in regularly, often you know, a cavity is not going to be at a big or advanced state by the time you come see us. So what are the common areas and so once you have these holes, what are the common areas that we see that are caught, you know, where the decay occurs? So the first is um, the back of the mouth. So if you think about what would be prime real estate for uh, bacteria and maybe the areas that you don't clean as well and that would be the back of the mouth. And so we think about the bacteria like and they're so much happier if they can hide back there. Hardly ever do you see, you know, a cavity like right on the front of someone's tooth. It's very advanced or there's some other reason if you're getting decay there. Generally, decay occurs in areas that are hard to reach and areas that are um, difficult, I guess, not just hard to reach, but maybe in areas with a lot of overlapping teeth. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But, you know, when we, when we think about these areas, we know that um, this is where we have to focus and we're more likely to get a cavity, particularly um, not just the back of the mouth, but in between the teeth. So the contact point between our teeth, which is what, what keeps the food from getting stuck in there, um, is actually about considered to be about I would say a quarter to a third of all the tooth surfaces in our mouth. And if we're not flossing, we're actually missing that. So the toothbrush is not breaking up the plaque or bacteria that is actually in between those the teeth there. So that is, again, just why we need to floss. So flossing seems like a big, you know, um, an annoying thing to have to do. It doesn't seem to be as rewarding. You don't feel as good after you've done it. But in fact, if you're not flossing, you're missing about at least a quarter of the two structures in your mouth. And that can also lead to other things, which I'm not going to talk about today, like such as bad breath but and gum disease. But the point is, is that this is the common areas that we see decay. So it's going to happen between the teeth. It's going to happen in teeth that are more overlapping. So if the surface of the teeth is more overlapped than others, so if you have two teeth that are kind of sitting this way against each other, there's a little bit more area, uh, you know, risk of decay there. And also just generally all in the back of the mouth. So when we take those x-rays on you, you may have noticed 
we tend to take them more routinely at the back of the mouth and sometimes we might take them in the front but we don't do that as very often because we know that your risk level uh, if you certainly don't get decay in the back you're probably not going to get a lot of decay in the front and so we take these x-rays a little bit more often in the back of the mouth and um, that's where we're seeing it so we'll track the progression like I said we have a new technology in our clinic called NERI and it's called near infrared uh, um, imaging and what it does is it in a non-radiographic way allows me just to scan your teeth so I can scan your whole mouth and check for these cavities even when we're not taking x-rays so that's something you can ask us about if you want to uh, during your checkup but it's it's really great because we're really able to assess uh, from a very um, early stage what this decay could look like another thing uh, is the uh, front of the mouth. So we, we're going to see decay in there a little bit sooner if, again, if we've done this scan. So that's with location. So you, everything about life is location, location, location. It's the same thing with teeth. Now, how does our parents, how does genetic roles play? Uh, you know, how does, how can we, uh, often we like to say, oh yeah, it's, I got that from my mom, I got that from my dad. And, and you know, it's, it's fun uh, to say that sometimes, but in true, in, in reality, we're really not inheriting dental decay or we're not inheriting many dental problems from our parents per se. Now I will qualify that because a couple of things we do inherit from our family members or our ancestors. And that is something like for example, dental crowding. So like I said, because of the location and how much teeth are overlapping, sometimes you know, you'll know you see parents come in and then they want their child's teeth straightened, but the parents themselves have very crowded teeth just like the child. So genetically we can get, and that can do with other uh, factors as well, such as you know um, airway and things like that, which I'll go into another day, but you, know, you can see a lot of the patterns of crowding. So you can inherit crowded teeth or bad bite from your family members and that like I said because of the surfaces and the more inability for you to clean still on you it's still it's still your fault um, if you're getting dental decay but it just makes it a little bit harder if you you have crowded teeth right um, so another thing though that we do genetically pass on which you don't realize it, it's sort of more of an environmental thing and that's saliva so let's say you ever see a mom and she has a baby and the baby has a soother or whatever and they drop it on the floor and then the mom puts the soother in their mouth and then they put it before like to clean it or whatnot for the baby I've seen this done many times I always cringe to give to the child and then that's passing on saliva so those bacteria levels in our mouth they also vary so you may have some people will get cavities, no cavities and they eat a lot of sugar but they just have low bacteria counts so if you are inheriting or you're getting from the saliva of your, you know, could be eating off some, you know, a, a family member's uh, fork or you're getting it from, again, from when you were little, you're getting those, that transmission of bacteria leading to higher bacteria counts, then you could, I guess, Jeanette sort of technically or somewhat say that you've inherited this, but it's more of, again, environmental as opposed to a true genetic, um, you know, transmission. And the other way that I thought of I could maybe share with you that you could genetically get some problems from your parents as far as this is enamel defects. So sometimes we do have there's certain things called enamel hypoplasia and we can have sort of a malformation in uh, our enamel sometimes that can be inherited and can uh, lead to like enamel that's just not as strong. But generally uh, it's not truly inherited and in fact um, a lot of my patients uh, over the years have said, you know, uh, Dr. Brown, my teeth are just soft, that's why, and my parents' teeth were soft, and, you know, enamel is what it is. It's a, it's a very, um, uh, it's like, you know, it's like bone, it has a very certain type of structure, genetic makeup, and it really doesn't, it isn't really any softer than anyone else's. So you have enamel that is just strong, it is what it is, it's up to you to keep it from getting weakened or getting kind of minerals taken from it. So that leads me to my last topic, which is, you know, how can we, if our teeth do get a little bit weakened and we've been bad and we haven't been brushing or flossing, you know, so of course we can start to brush and floss more, but there is actually a way to help re-harden some of the enamel that's been weakened. So it's not too late. So if your dentist says to you, you know, you've just got some areas that are just starting, this is, this is what we should do. So what we generally recommend is, of course, to 
like I said, increase in brushing and flossing, maybe the areas, identify the areas that we're concerned with, but also then apply or make sure we're using a fluoride toothpaste, but then doing a daily rinse of a fluoride, um, could be a non-alcohol based fluoride rinse. Uh, there, there's many out there. Uh, try to find one that you like, but what that does, so a fluoride will do a few things actually. First of all, what it'll do is it will reharden um, the enamel. So it actually gets incorporated back into the crystalline structure or um, basically uh, build of the enamel and actually can be replaced uh, for with missing ions, which were the calcium ions. So you can actually put fluoride back in and reharden your enamel. So you can actually help heal your own uh, enamel. If you find these helpful, I would love it if you'd leave me a comment, share. And also, I even think sometimes, you know, sharing these things with our kids because it's kind of nice to hear this from somebody else other than mom or dad. And uh, to all the kids out there, you know, I hope you are really trying to remember to brush and floss because that is just one of those things. I, I'm a little concerned that dental decay may rise in the um, in the coming year because of just the, the habits and things that our patterns of change and our snacking and types of things that we've been doing at home. So I hope you're all, uh, again, very safe and sound and eager to get back to whatever the new normal is. And like I said, if you want to message me, you have any questions, I'm always available. And um, I just want to thank you. So thanks everybody. And I will see you next time.